Hey everybody, welcome to our very first episode of Canty Cook It. I'm your host, Theo Canty, and I am super excited about this show. I want to start the show off right though. I want to let you guys know that I am not a chef. You know, I don't have a chef designation. I didn't go to culinary school or anything like that. I'm just a regular guy, just like you guys who loves to cook and be in the kitchen. Everything that you see, I've learned from watching videos, television, and YouTube, or uh, just the internet. So I'm really excited to share this show with you. The entire point of this show is to interact with you, to be more interactive. Even in our social media pages, you'll see me live. You'll see me hopefully soon in person once we get past all of our current environment. Uh, I'm in just ecstatic. So what we're gonna be cooking today, one of my favorite things in the world, steak. We are gonna go to Klein's Custom Meat Market to pick out a nice, delicious, juicy steak to cook. Because this is our first episode, so why not do something big and special? We're also gonna be preparing mashed potatoes and a recipe that I created myself, which is this cabbage and red onion gorgonzola sauce type thing. I don't know how to really identify it, but I will just say one day I was in the kitchen and I had some cabbage and some onions and some gorgonzola and I was like, I need to cook all of these things. So let me go ahead and put it in a pot. And it turned out delicious. So I'm gonna bring that to you today and we are gonna go get started. So first, we're gonna start with our prep and then we'll go to the meat market. Uh, we'll start with our <laughs> potatoes. Um, what we're gonna do with our potatoes is cut them up I wanna talk a little bit about potatoes. First, rinse them, wash them, scrub them, get the dirt off. These are russet potatoes. And the reason why I like to use russet potatoes is that they are earthy, buttery, and just, a, to me, they're more delicious. A lot of people will suggest that you use the golden Yukon for mashed potatoes, but to me, I feel like russets are the way to go. But you can decide for yourself. I'm doing russet. We're gonna weigh out our potatoes. We want about a pound and a half of potatoes. I do recommend that you guys purchase a kitchen scale. If not, just use what they have at the grocery store. We're gonna be using it a lot in this show, I can tell you, especially when we bake things. So we have our pound and a half of potatoes here. We are not going to peel them. I like peels on. If you don't like the peels on your mashed potatoes, what I recommend, cut this up into larger chunks, boil it, and then peel the potatoes. The potato skin has a lot of nutrients and flavor that we want to get into our potatoes. That's why we're gonna cook them with the skin on. Now, I like to do small cubes of potatoes. So basically you cut off a chunk, yikes. All right, cut, cut, cut. And then you cube them out and you get nice small chunks. This is also good if you don't like the skin but still want it to be on there because now the skin isn't gonna be so big. You won't get those big chunks of skin in the potatoes. You're gonna get smaller chunks or smaller slivers of skin and it might be a little bit more palpable. So we're gonna go ahead and get this cut up. We're gonna put it into a bowl of water and then we're gonna let these soak in the refrigerator. We're gonna use cold water. We're gonna let these soak in the refrigerator for about two hours and then we're gonna cook them. The reason why we want to soak them is we wanna let the starch get out of them so that we get a nice fluffy potato and not a gluey uh, mashed potato. All right, cool. All right, so we got our potatoes all set. Now we're gonna work on our cabbage. Cabbage, I love cabbage and I especially love red cabbage. But I will say, red cabbage is not in season right now so it took a lot for me to find this. I had to go to like three different grocery stores to find a nice head of cabbage. They were all pretty old looking. This is probably the prettiest one I could find and it's also really small. Red cabbage usually grows pretty big, but again, red cabbage is out of season right now. It doesn't come back until like September of next year, I believe. Um, so September through December is when you should really be buying red cabbage. So we're just right outside of the season. But, I found some, we're gonna cook it, it's still gonna be delicious. We have here about, well, a, a small head, just a whole small head. We're gonna chop this up 
and we're going to get it going. Now, with cabbage, of course, like any other type of vegetables such as this, I don't even know what these are called. I'm going to have to look that up, and I'll let you guys know. You want to take off the first couple of leaves off of the peel because they're pretty old, and you want to rinse it off. We rinse this off, and we patted it dry, uh, and then we're going to go ahead and get it cut. You can cut this roughly. I like a thin slivers, so we're just going to chop this head off like that. Oh, so pretty, y'all. That's so pretty. Um, and then just rough chop. Nothing crazy. And we're going to do this to the whole thing and get it going. One of the things that I do want to talk about with red cabbage, too, is acidity comp or content, red or purple, whatever you want to call this. The reason why this cabbage is purple is because of the amount of acid within the cabbage. And when you rinse it or when you let it sit out for too long or cook it, you'll notice that it'll start turning blue. The way to correct that is to add more acid, acid, acidity back to it. And we're going to do that with uh, some apple cider vinegar. But we're going to go ahead and get these guys chopped up and rinsed off. So I'll see you guys in a second. All right. So the last thing that we need for our... Uh, cabbage is the onion, of course. We're doing cabbage and onions and a red onion as well, or purple onion. I mean, that's whatever. But we're going to cut this up in a similar fashion with the onions. You know, you want to peel off the piece, but you got to take off the top of the head. And I try to leave as much onion as possible so that we aren't wasting onion. Uh, so the tops and the bottoms, again, just a nice rough cut, rough cut vegetables are delicious you can just slice it down the middle uh, I mean I guess the vegetables are delicious period it doesn't matter how you cut them that's kind of weird to say but anyway um, we're gonna go ahead and slice these up we want nice uh, cindric or not cindrical like slivers I guess one thing that I forgot to do let's peel off that I don't think I did I did peel off a layer earlier no we don't need to so good. We didn't need to peel off a layer. Sometimes you have to peel off that first layer so that they will separate right. Or you'll kind of get this filmy thing inside. But yep. Yeah. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Cut these up. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Canty Cook It and what we do, how we do it, and all that other stuff. If you watch the promo video, I said that I would tell you guys about the name later. And this is what I'm here to do. So when I was in high school, I ran for vice president and this was my senior year of high school. And I said, I'm going to run for vice president and I'm going to win. And so I came up with this catchy slogan, which was, can't he do it? Yes, he can. And <laughs> I won. I did. What did I do for my class that year? Absolutely nothing. I, I feel bad for the girl who ran against me. Her name was Sarah. Sarah, I'm sorry if you're watching this. Uh, because I don't remember doing anything for that class. And I'm going to go ahead and admit that to my classmates. If there was something you asked me to do, I didn't do it. I'm sorry. Not, I mean, but that was also like 10 years ago. So I hope you're over it by now. Um, so that slogan followed me throughout my life. I kind of held on to it whenever I would do things. So now whenever I do things, I go, can't you do it? Yes, you can. And I know that's really cheesy and hokey, but it gets me through a lot. So can't he cook it? Yes, he can. And you can too. All right. So we got our onions cut up. We're going to get these in a bowl. Um, I'm not going to necessarily mix these with the cabbage just yet. I mean, I guess we could. It doesn't really matter. Uh, we'll put this in the same bowl as the cabbage. And then we will be off to, I want to cut this one up just a little bit more. We will be off to Klein's to meet up with the owner, Joe. And Joe is going to help us pick out some delicious juicy or a delicious juicy steak and i'm so excited y'all like y'all don't even know i'm so excited about the steak i can't wait to see what joe has to tell us about and we are off let's do it all right so we're here outside of klein's custom meats we're gonna go inside and talk to the owner, Joe Klein, pick out some steaks, so let's go inside. All right, so we are here at Klein's and we are with 
Joe Klein of Klein's Custom Meats. We're gonna uh, talk to Joe for a little bit and figure out what steak we're gonna eat. And we're gonna go from there. But first, I wanna ask Joe to, to tell us a little bit about the meat market and how you guys got started, how long have you been here? Uh, we've been open just about two and a half years now. Uh, I've been in the beef business just 13 years plus, uh, working for two beef companies out of the state of Florida. Oh, wow. And then, uh, you know, working this territory in Jacksonville for nine years for one of the companies, you know, I saw a big demand for a quality butcher shop of something we didn't have here in town, especially in the San Marco neighborhood. Uh, a little backstory on my wife, she comes from Morocco, and that's a picture of her father in 1978 in a butcher shop that they converted, he converted their family room you know, kind of on a storefront, uh, in a cow. sense, opened a butcher shop. Wow. So she moved here about 17 years ago and, ironically enough, married a meat guy and <laughs> uh, we came up with this concept and here we are. That's awesome. Well, this has been one of my favorite stops for the last, I think I've been coming in here for about two months now. Um, and usually I come in to get a Wagyu, or Wagyu burger yep. because I can't always go on the other side of things and it's just me. Um, but those things are so delicious. I tell you, I have not been able to eat a regular burger since. <laughs> Thank you. And I try to come in at least once a week just yeah. to grab two or so. Um, but we're here to buy some steaks today. So tell me a little bit about uh, butcher shops. Tell me about um, why people should shop at butcher shops as opposed to grocery stores. You know, we're, we're unique in the fact that we, we source our beef and, our, and become loyal to certain, uh, you know, ranches or programs, you know, as the larger you know, grocers, retailers, you know, not naming any, but, you know, they kind of buy on a week-to-week -week basis. Mm. And the difference between, you know, a family-owned butcher shop knows the ins and outs of the beef industry as far as the age of product, how to source it correctly. And typically, I don't shop generally on price. As much as on price conscience, I'm not going to change my beef program because it's 25 cents a pound different per week. The larger grocery sales stores, I mean, you see how much they would buy in a, just a weekly basis. Mm -hmm you know, they'll switch programs for a nickel. Oh, wow. We are very uh, loyal to one of our programs. 90% of our beef comes out of Olivia, Minnesota. Uh, we've been doing that for just about two years now. Incredible program. All of my meat in my case, in my requirement, is wet aged 30 to 40 days. Now, you mentioned that, and uh, the first time I was in here, one of the associates talked a little bit about that, and they were talking about how that's such a difference from regular grocery stores, is the aging process. Yes. In a regular grocery store, and correct me if I'm wrong, what happens is they get the meat and they just put it out. They package it and they put it out. Pretty much. Whereas you guys do something a little bit different. Yeah, so we, we, you know, we'll buy a product and uh, if it's not quite from our vendors or our ranches at 30 days age, I'll sit on it here. Uh, whereas the larger grocers, they buy you know, week in and week out to seven to 10 day old beef. Mm. Beef needs to age a minimum of 21 days to achieve the tenderness and the flavor profile. So basically what you're getting at a large retail, yeah, you can get lucky and get a good steak there. Mm -hmm. Nine times out of 10, you're gonna get a tough one because it hasn't aged properly and it doesn't quite have the beef flavor. Gotcha, awesome. So we're gonna pick out some steaks today. Yes. I would like something, I mean, we're going all out. This okay. is our first episode. We wanna do something special. So what would you recommend that's not a tomahawk? I know everybody is super interested in those right now. They're super popular. Yeah. But what would you do outside of that? You know, one of my go-tos is a cowboy ribeye. Okay. It's a full bone in ribeye, very similar to a tomahawk. The only difference is you don't have the long bone with the tomahawk, mm -hmm. but it's the same exact cut. It's a ribeye. Uh, I like this particular cut that's in the case. It has a large spinalis, mm. which, and, you, and then you have the eye of the ribeye. You kind of get two different flavor uh, textures and taste. Uh, beautiful cut. Uh, this one's been aged 40 days, uh, wet aged, and I think this would be perfect for you. Awesome. Well, I, it looks beautiful. Um, I think we're gonna take it. Tell me a little bit about cooking, your, your suggestions for cooking and how you would cook it. Yeah, there's quite a few different techniques out there. Uh, one popular being reverse seared, mm -hmm. uh, where guys would kind of start this on a low temperature at first, and at the end, kick it up to a high heat, give it a nice sear on each side. You know, something like this, it's about two and a half pounds. Uh, probably about a 15 minute cook time, 20 minute cook time if you can do reverse sear. Uh, typically, I like to just, you know, give it a nice hard sear on a cast iron, mm -hmm. uh, a little bit of olive oil, salt and pepper and then you know, finish it in the oven for about five to six minutes each side. Gotcha, awesome. Cool, well, we are gonna take this Excellent. one. It's gonna be delicious, I'm excited. Um, everybody, take some time to go out, to everybody in Jacksonville, take some time to go out, 
Klein's Custom Meats here in San Marco. They'd be happy to serve you. Joe's an awesome guy. They got tons of really great product here. We're gonna get this, wrap it up, and take it home. All right, so we are back from Klein's, y'all, and we have <sighs> heaven. I mean, look at this. I'm not sorry about any of this. Like, look at this marbling you got going on here all throughout. This is what is going to make this dinner so amazing. Um, this definitely is a cut for one to two people three maybe if you um if you like smaller portions but i mean this is what a ribeye is all about so i'm excited about cooking this when we cook steaks one of the important things that we want to make sure that we're doing is one pat dry we want to make sure that the steak is dry so when it hits that pan you get a nice Sear, right and that's what's gonna give you that nice crust on the outside uh, on both sides the second thing that we want to do or we want to make sure that we do is bring it up to room temp you don't want to put the steak I mean if you're gonna go home and cook it right away it's probably up to room temp uh, but if you do stick the steak in the refrigerator to cook later on in the day or tomorrow or whatever you wanna make sure that you bring it up to room temp. And the reason that you wanna bring it up to room temp is it's a muscle and it's like any other muscle. So when you go outside and it's cold, what do you do? You tense up, right? Oh my gosh, it's so cold. Now imagine then putting, uh, I don't know, a iron to that, a hot iron to that. Your skin will seize up even more because now it's something hot has touched it and so it doesn't get to relax. What happens when you decide to let your steaks get to room temperature or any meat for that matter is that it relaxes and then it cooks a nice even cook it doesn't tense up and you get a soft and tender meat so that's what we're going to do here with our steaks they are going to or our steak we're going to let it get up to room temperature and then we're going to go ahead pat it dry cook it and get it done now how we're going to flavor our steak today with a steak like joe said salt and pepper is really all you need we're gonna add a little bit of extra oomph to that steak just to give it some more aromatic smells and fumes to it. What we're gonna use is some sprigs of rosemary when we uh, put the steak on, as well as some garlic, which we have over here, and, uh, and some butter. But that's all a part of the process. We're gonna get to that in a second. Right now, we're gonna get back to our potatoes and make those as well as our cabbage. So, here we go. All right, so now we got our we got, uh, we rinse off our potatoes. We're gonna go ahead and get them started. I got my water boiling. And when you talk about using uh, stainless steel, which is what we're using to cook today, um, you want to salt the or salt the water after the water starts to boil. If you do it beforehand, you can scratch out the bottom of your cast iron or excuse me, your steel. And we don't want to do that. So. We're gonna do that. You don't need a lot because again, we only have a pound and a half of potatoes. You don't wanna over salt because you don't want too salt. You can, my mom always says, you can, um, you can always add more, but you can't take away. So we're gonna go ahead and sizzle, sizzle, get our potatoes in that pot. Be careful. No one wants to be boiling. That's not fun. All right, I got a lot of water in there, so we are gonna turn down the turn down the heat a little bit because we don't want this to overflow. Adjust the heat. We're gonna let those cook. They should cook for about 15 to 20 minutes, and they'll get nice and soft, and we'll be able to drain them and mash them up. So we're gonna move on now to our cabbage mixture, cabbage, onions. Um, we're gonna go ahead and start with apple cider vinegar. Now with the cabbage, I don't really have me measurements necessarily, mostly because you never know how much cabbage you're gonna get. 
Uh, I try to cook the whole cabbage head at once. So big cabbage, small cabbage. But we do want to at least coat the bottom of the pan. Um, we're not looking to boil this down or anything, anything crazy like that. So we don't need a lot. Just enough to kind of coat the bottom of that pan. We're going to go ahead and get that started. You don't necessarily need a high heat, more like a medium heat. All right. And then we want to take our brown sugar. I like to do this with a grain of salt because you don't want to put too much brown sugar or it'll be too sweet, too little. And then it'll have this really acidic flavor to it that we don't want either. We just kind of want to cut in to get a nice middle. I'm not going to use all of this. We're just going to take a nice clump for now and put that on the bottom of our pan. All right. Wipe our hands off. I'm going to stir this in. And we're not looking to make caramel, so we're not. We're really just kind of wanting to melt that sugar, uh, melt the sugar down. And once we get that sugar melted down, we'll be able to, we'll go ahead and add our cabbage. Um, and we'll go from there. So one of the reasons why I really got into cooking, and you can see this on our website, is uh, I enjoy, well, one of the reasons I started cooking was I was broke. Broke is all get out, and I was living in Boston at the time, going to school, and I really enjoyed going out to eat, but at that point, I could not afford to go out, any, go out to eat anymore. I mean, I sold my car. So I was living down, well, I was living in Florida and I left my car here in Florida. So I sold my car so I can pay my rent uh, and some other things just to make sure that I could pay my rent for that for that first two months that I was there. Um, but I couldn't afford to eat. I was eating ramen noodles and sausages and whatever. So one of the questions that came up for me was, how do I cook good food at home? And that's when I started my cooking journey. And it has been a fun, fun ride ever since then, I will say. Uh, from there, I, I started barbecuing and baking, and I just enjoy this a lot. So our sugar has melted. We are going to go ahead and add in our cabbage and onions. Just kind of mix those together. It smells so good. The smell of raw onions. I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but I love the smell of raw onion. So we're going to go ahead and get that going. Add that in. You might find, depending on the size or the amount of vinegar, depending on the size of the cabbage and the amount of vinegar and sugar you added, you might find that you have to add more. This is definitely more than enough for this steak. This is more like a couple days worth, which I'm okay with. I like leftover um, sides. I don't really care for leftover main dishes. I like the leftover sides because then I don't have to cook sides every day. Now, we got a nice full pot here. I'm gonna let that cook a little bit. I was gonna have to cook down some. I am gonna add some more vinegar. And I'll probably add some more uh, brown sugar to this as well. Again, we just wanted to cook down a little bit. We're not adding a lot here, just enough to kind of get the bottom, just get the juices going through, cook the juices out. I'm gonna add some more brown sugar a little bit later once it starts to heat up a little bit. I'm gonna go ahead and put the top on it. And as you can see, our potatoes are starting to boil back up a little bit. Probably aren't ready. What I like to do, take a skewer, a fork, toothpick, whatever, kind of poke in, see where we are. We can't poke through anything yet. So I'm gonna let those cook for a little bit longer. Start to see they're starting to bubble up a little bit. And then we'll go ahead and get to mashing. Now, I wanna talk about these mashed potatoes. One, let's talk about tools. There's several different ways you can mash your mashed potatoes. I like to use just a regular potato masher. Uh, you can also use a potato ricer. Turn it down a little bit, starting to boil over. 
You can also use a potato ricer, uh, which kind of gives you a nice, nice, creamy mashed potato texture. The masher, you might still get some lumps. So we cut these up pretty small, so we might not get as many lumps. Uh, also, butter. Butter is so important with mashed potatoes, of course. There are a lot of different recipes out there on the internet that talk about how to cook mashed potatoes, what are the best mashed potatoes, um, and butter content. Now, in a French style mashed potato, the mashed potatoes of mashed potatoes, they use uh, what is a one to two ratio. So for every one pound of butter, they use two sticks or one cup of, uh, excuse me, for one pound of potatoes, they use one cup or two sticks of butter. That's a lot. They are delicious. Um, I tried that a couple of times. It's a little rich. It's very rich for my taste. So we're going to reduce this down. Uh, since we are doing a pound and a half of potatoes, we're going to use two sticks of butter for that pound and a half. So just to cut through it a little bit. Again, I feel like these rusted potatoes give a nice buttery texture anyway. So potatoes are bo boiling. Looks like we might be able to stir in our cabbage some more. Get those flavors. Y'all, this smells so good. Like, ugh. Food on its own is just so delicious. And when you get raw, natural flavors, it's another thing. Like, think about it. So far, we've only added vinegar and sugar, no salt, no pepper. And I think that's one of the really awesome things about when you get in the kitchen and learn how to cook and learn how to season, you learn how to control some of those things where if your doctor says, or if, or if you're just on your own watching your sodium intake, you know how to do that. You know how to manage those flavors to where you get these rich, bold, delicious flavors without using a lot of salt or a lot of pepper or a lot of different seasonings altogether. Um, and that's kind of the way food should be, right? Like food should stand on its own with little to no extra help. There are some things that of course we need to add lots of flavor to and we'll be cooking those things on the show. But uh, I wish y'all could smell this amazingness right now so we're gonna let this cook some more and um give our potatoes about five or ten more minutes and we'll be ready to mash them all right so we're back uh our potatoes still need a little bit more time i'm going to turn them down just a little bit because they're just about done but um our cabbage has cooked down tremendously so we're going to check in on that we're going to stir it oh my gosh that smells so good y'all mmm Definitely a strong vinegar smell coming off of that. I am gonna add some more brown sugar just to kind of help sweeten that pot up a little bit. Ugh, y'all don't even know. So we're gonna add our gorgonzola, which is really what's gonna give us this nice, creamy and pungent, but also lend itself to the sweetness. What I like about Gorgonzola is it's like, in my opinion, the uh, upgraded blue cheese. It's like the Italian said, oh, y'all got blue cheese French people? Well, we're gonna go ahead and give you some Gorgonzola and show you what flavor is really about. So that's what I really like about Gorgonzola. We just added about a cup of Gorgonzola to this mixture. It doesn't take a lot. Gorgonzola is pretty powerful on its own. And I wish, ugh, wish y'all could smell the smells. I keep saying that, but I really do wish that y'all were here to join with me. Now this is cooking down pretty good. I'm gonna let it cook for a few more minutes. I'm actually gonna reduce the heat on this because it really has reduced down a lot from that top of pot type. Uh, and we want to keep it nice and crunchy. We don't want it to get wilty, willowy, if you know what I mean. Um, so we're going to let this cook down for just a little bit more. I'm going to put the lid back on it. Boom. And we are going to move back over to drain our mashed potatoes and get to mashing. So join me. Okay, so we went ahead and drained our um, potatoes and we are ready to mash those. Now, also, y'all, I tasted that cabbage and 
it is phenomenal. I did end up using all the sugar. I can't tell you how much, but just taste and see. I do need to add some salt and pepper to it. We're gonna add a little bit, one other ingredient to it just to kind of help thicken up, but that's not what we're here to talk about right now. We're talking about these potatoes and um, mm, it smells so good. Like I said, russet potatoes to me smell and taste buttery on their own. So that's why one, I don't feel like we need a lot. There's this earthy smell. Uh, and two, that's why I like them over uh, Yukon Golden. Um, but again, preference. We have about two sticks, well, exactly two sticks. I went ahead and cut them up. I let them sit out, they're nice and soft. We're gonna go ahead and add that straight in there. Just add it straight in. You can also melt the butter if you want to and pour it in. Uh, either way is fine. We'll take our potato masher, mash that through and through, and really get it. Now I also like, I don't know, y'all tell me, I am a food texture and color type person. And one of the other reasons why I didn't necessarily care for the golden was because they were too yellow. And I was like, no, I want my nice, soft, creamy looking mashed potatoes. And that bothered me. So y'all tell me what y'all think. I know when it comes to food and texture, I'm on it like, not on it as in I know my foods and texture, as in I really eat food or don't eat food because of color and or texture. Sometimes things I'm like, look, that just don't sit right with me. Seafood. And we're gonna cook seafood on this show. I'm gonna bring on some special guests to go through seafood with me, because I don't eat it. I don't eat it because I don't like the texture of it. Um, I do like lobster. That's the one thing that I did find that I do like. But it's always a texture thing, always. But we got our potatoes nice and mashed. Oh, look how thick that is, creamy, y'all. I'm so excited. This came out exactly the way I wanted it to. You don't wanna over mash because you don't want to release too much of the starch and glutens in the potato, which really add to that gluey texture. Um, we are going to salt and pepper our mashed potatoes to taste, to taste. Some of y'all like salty potatoes. Some of y'all don't. I don't. I feel like there needs to be a nice balance. I prefer a nice peppery potato over salted, um, or overly salted, I should say. And we are using fresh cracked pepper, peppercorn. Oof, cabbage is coming up. And, I don't know, do it how you feel. Now I am using stainless steel material here, so everything that I generally use to stir is silicon. Here we go, right here. Uh, because I don't wanna scratch up the bottom of my pots. Y'all should've just saw how this spoon just went through these potatoes. Bye. Bye. Y'all can turn the show off. Turn off the cameras. I'm just gonna go sit in the room with this pot by myself. I'll cook a steak later. But really good. Uh, as far as salt goes, I don't know if I talked about it while I was salting the water. Again, you don't need to put too much because you've already salted the water. So we're just gonna add like a dash. Literally just a dash. And this is gray sea salt. Uh, it's really good. It is nice and flavorful. I believe it comes out of the Mediterranean, but it's heavy on the flavor. So a, a little goes a long way. I do think that I could use some more pepper. It's just a really a look and taste thing for me. I'm gonna put a little bit more pepper. And then, mm, 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 mm. That's it, y'all. That's it. All right, oof. Whew. So while we got these potatoes are done creamy, we can put them back on to the uh, or the stove. If you have a warming setting on your stove, you can do that. Uh, you can also put them on a low heat. You don't want to overcook them, of course, because you don't want them to dry out. But we're gonna set this in the middle of our stove because I do have a warmer setting on that. 
and we're going to go back to our cabbage, which should be just about done. While we were away, or while I cut out, I guess is what you guys are going to see. Um, what I did was started to heat up my cast iron skillet. I'm going to talk about cast iron and why you need cast iron for the steak. Uh, so I got it heating up. We're going to be able to add our oil to it in just a moment. Once we add our oil to it, we're going to let that oil come up. But ah, I digress. Stay on track, Theo. Get back to the cabbage. Talk about the cabbage. And here we go. All right. Back on the. All right, so our cabbage looks so good. It's cooked down a lot, y'all. Um, see, we got it reduced. Y'all see a lot of runoff too, right? Um, what we're gonna do is to help this kind of thicken up a little bit is add some flour. Not a lot, probably about two, three tablespoons of flour. Stir that in. I'm gonna let that thicken up so we get a nice, almost like a, I hate to say gravy, but it's kind of like a gravy. Um, so we'll let that get nice and thick. Let it cook for a little bit longer. It's still nice and crunchy. That's what I like. And we're going to move on to our steak. All right. So we are going to season our steaks now. Or our steak. I keep saying steaks with an S when it's just one. I mean, it could feed more than one person. We're going to season our steak. The key to seasoning a steak or cooking a steak, pat dry. Just get a paper towel or two. I mean, this is a pretty thick steak. And just pat it dry. Don't worry, that salt, that pepper, it's gonna stick. Don't be one of those people who are afraid to touch your meat. If you are, put on some gloves. Like, come on, y'all. You got to get in there, get that. If you want it to taste good, you got to get in there. So we're going to pat our meat dry. I'm going to talk about Abby for a minute. My dog is here and she is just licking her chops right now. She thinks she's going to get some, but that's just not going to happen. But uh, I love her so much. Anyway, so we're going to nice sea salt again and we're going to salt our steak the thing with steak and any type of meat especially a meat this thick don't be afraid to season um you got a lot of, of coverage to get here right so one course some people use kosher salt that's also good think about it like this this salt is not going to penetrate all the way through this meat so you need to make sure you have enough of the crust on top to get not through the meat, but so that you still have flavor through every bite of meat. All right. Make sure you get that fat cap. I kind of turn this this way. See that nice fat cap? Oof. Get your sides. Same thing over here. Get your sides. Pepper grinder, generous, generous pepper. And I'm gonna take this over, get some oil in our pan, get that nice and hot. What we wanna do with the pan, as well as getting it hot, we wanna put some oil in that pan. We're gonna use a high smoke point oil, like uh, grapeseed oil, vegetable oil have really high smoke, and I. I want to say sunflower seed oil does too. Don't quote me on that one, but I believe it does. Uh, and because they, those have a high smoke temperature, which means that it takes a lot more heat to get them to smoke, uh, it means that we can get a pan nice and hot and we get that really heavy, heavy sear. Uh, then we're going to sear them on both sides for about five minutes each side and stick them into the broiler and broil for about 10 more minutes, five on each side. And we'll get it going. Now we do also have our rosemary, our butter, and our garlic mixture that we're gonna do. And we'll do that on the second side of the sear. And I'll show you guys how to do it. It's really easy. Let's take these over to the oven or to the stove and get cooking. All right, so 
Real talk, y'all. At this point, our mics went out. It's our first episode, so bear with us. Uh, I'm trying to make it through this just like you guys are. So um, we're gonna get, I'm gonna talk through the rest of this and I'll show you guys how we cook the steak. You won't get to hear all the fun sounds, so I'm sorry, but next time, I promise. All right, so we're gonna start with adding our oil to our already hot skillet. We're gonna add about two tablespoons. This is what's gonna help us get a nice sear on our steak. And you wanna have the temperature of the skillet to a medium, medium high. You don't want it too hot because we don't wanna burn the oil. We just want it to start to smoke. And move that oil around, get that pan nice and coated. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and sear our steak. Oh man, I wish you guys could have heard that sizzle. Remember, we're gonna sear our steaks for about five minutes on each side to get that nice crust that we want. All right, now we're gonna turn our steak over. Look at that, guys. It looks amazing. Whew. So the next thing we're gonna do is let this sear for about two minutes and we'll add our butter and garlic and rosemary and baste the steak for a minute or two. We're gonna add our butter, garlic, and rosemary and we're gonna baste our steak. You wanna make sure that you spoon all over the steak once you get that butter to melt. We did reduce the temperature here because we didn't wanna burn our butter. This is gonna help us get a nice caramel notes to it. Nah, I don't know if that's the best word, but it's the word I'm going with today. It gives it a nice crusty taste, I guess. Delicious. Oh, and it smells perfect. You also wanna make sure that you do sear the sides. Get it nice and brown and toasted on those sides as well. So make sure you get a nice even cook and sear, especially with a steak this thick. If you're using a thin steak, eh, you might wanna skip this. I wish I knew what I was talking about here, but I don't. So if you're good at reading lips, pay attention. If not, whatever. All right, so we do have our broiler already set at high, and we're gonna get our steaks in the oven. Steak, I keep doing that. Even in the voiceover, I say steaks. I don't know, I'm crazy. We're gonna let those broil for about five minutes on each side. We're looking for a medium to medium rare, or I guess it's the other way around, medium rare to medium on the cook of the steak, which is about five to five four minutes, five to six minutes on each side. Man, I'm really off on my numbers today. Oof. And here we are. Look at that steak. Oh my goodness, it is so good. So it's important that you take the steak out before the desired doneness. Like I said, we're going for a medium rare to medium. So we took the steak out at about 135 degrees, which is five or so degrees off from the temperature that we're looking for. When you let the steak rest, it uh, gets all those juices in and it still cooks so it gets up to the desired temperature. Now, look at that. We have a delicious cabbage, mashed potatoes, and steak dinner. How lovely. Oh, and then we cut through it. This was probably the easiest steak to cut ever. I mean, the knife just kind of, I don't know, it just went through that steak so easy. And as we open it up, oh my gosh. Look at that, y'all. Look at it. So pretty and pink inside. Juicy, flavorful 
and we cut the first bite. Oh, mm, and taste it. I know you can see on my face that I really, really enjoyed this. Guys, this has been such a fun experience. I'm so glad that you tuned in to our first episode. I'm sorry about the glitch, but like I said, we'll make it right next time. Definitely gonna dock my guy for all the work he has done. No, really, he's been amazing. I'm super excited about this and our next episode. I'm glad to cook with you today. Can't he cook it? Yes, he can. He did, and now, you can too. See you guys next time. I'm Theo Canty. Bye.